1 Corinthians 12, 4, 5, and 6. Listen to what he says. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, capital A, is Holy Spirit. Different gifts, same Holy Spirit. We all get the same Holy Spirit who indwells us, but we get a different gifted ministry. He, it's his responsibility. We will see later, as Paul goes on into the discussion here, you will see that he distributes it. For example, in verse 11, the Holy Spirit distributes it. And notice in verse 11, just as he wills. He distributes it to each person as he will. Not as you will, but as he wills. Okay? That's verse 4. Verse 5. And there are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. S different ministries, gifted ministries, different gifted ministries... The gift is under the office of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the gift is under the office of the second member of the head, of the Godhead, the Son. But notice he's not called that here. He's not referred to as the Son. We have God the Father. We have the Holy Spirit. But we don't have the Son. He's called the Lord and for a good reason. You do see that. There are a variety of ministries, but we all have the same Lord, but we have different ministries. If you have a gift, you have a ministry. The distribution of the gift of that aspect is under the Holy Spirit. The ministry of it to the body of Christ, because Christ is the head and the Savior of the body, all of the ministry functions under his office. And then we have six. There are a variety of effects or performances or the results of the gift ministry working. There are a variety of effects or performances of that gift, but the same God who works all things in all persons, notice persons in, is in italics, it was put there, to make a smooth translation for you to understand it. It's not there in the original text. It doesn't need to be. All three members of the Godhead in the plan of God in the church age are committed. They have committed themselves into the plan of God where each of them have a distinct function of your spiritual gift. Never Never, never, never has that ever occurred. We are the most unique divine agency that God has ever had. I don't know that you realize it, and you're a member of that. And this is what God has pledged in the, the plan of God. This is what's been pledged to you for your gifted ministry you do understand everybody's got one. <laughs> There's no ungifted. There's no unspiritually gifted people in the church at all. I'm not talking about talents. I'm talking about supernatural gifts distributed and given by the Holy Spirit in the plan of God, ministered, operated by the Lord. The reason he's called the Lord is because he sits at the right hand of God the Father. That's why he's called the Lord here and not Son, because he is the Lord of the ministry. At some point, you have got to buy into this program. At some point in your life, you've got to take this serious. This is a big deal. All three members of the Godhead are involved in your spiritual gifted ministry. This is a big deal. After a word of prayer, we're going to come back. We're going to dissect this. We're going to exegete it and take a look at it because there's much more here than I've read. There's a lot more here for you to know than what I've read in the English. Let us pray. 
The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in the Christian life. It could be mental attitudes type sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. You confess that sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, to restore yourself to spirituality of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with your spirituality. The cleansing, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And cleansing, the cleansing goes back to verse 7, the propitious work of Christ on the cross to the life to deal with sin, not for salvation in the Christian life, that's in the unbeliever's life, but to deal with spirituality. Living in the dynamics of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would teach us great truths today about our spiritual gift and the commitment God has made in his plan through God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to cause our great ministry, personal ministries to the church, an enormous event in our life. It is far greater than any other event in our life next to our salvation. For I've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Notice up there in, in my introduction, I laid out, I want you to call, I want to call your attention to a, a couple things. I, first of all, I want to call your attention uh, to the fact that you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Lord, the Son of God, and you have God the Father. And this is unique. Whenever you find these three in, engaged in any event, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And listen, he's engaged a lot. They're engaged a lot in the church age. More than, more than you realize. And so what I did is I broke this out because I want you to see the order and the responsibility. Notice the order they're in and notice the responsibility. The order is to the plan of God. And so he mentions the Holy Spirit first because... He's the distributor. It is the advent of the Holy Spirit that's dynamic in the church age. The incarnation is really, really neat. In the first half of the incarnation, it's all about Christ. It's the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. It's the Holy Spirit bringing a, a unique birth into the world. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God dwelling among us. The second half of the incarnation story is that Jesus goes back to heaven and the Holy Spirit takes his place. Takes his place. Jesus goes back to heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and the Holy Spirit takes his place. Oh, yes, it does, because in John 14, 15, and 16, when he was discussing this whole, this whole deal... He said it. It's to your advantage that I, I go away. If I don't go away, he will not come. When he comes, he called them the paracletus. He called them another comforter. And he used the word alas, meaning another like me. A comforter like God the Father and God the Son would be God the Holy Spirit. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Spiritual gifts, you wonder why I teach it every year, and you don't pay attention. I don't know why you don't pay attention. <laughs> I can't do anything about that. I sound probably frustrated sometimes, but look, I can't do anything. All I can do is teach it. I can't make you, I can't make you understand it. I can't make you believe it. I got to just tell you the truth about it. But I'm telling you, it's the dynamics of your life. Next to your salvation, nothing your career, your marriage, your family, nothing, 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 nothing compares with the fact that God has gifted you with a spiritual ministry. When you get to heaven, you'll realize it. Now, I'm not saying these other are not important. They pale in comparison. So we have the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing I want you to pay attention. I want you to pay attention to the order and the responsibility. Notice the order. 
We got the Spirit, the Lord, and God. That's not a normal order. You do know that. I mean, who talks that way? We always talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit because that's how they're ranked. You know that, don't you? Of course you do. And when they're not, when they're out of order, a new order is established on something. It's just the way it is, people. It's who's emphasized first. Here it is, the Spirit, because he's the because it's a, and the subject. Whenever you see them out of order, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When they're out of order, you pay attention to the context because something's going on contextually that has put them in a different order of responsibility. I know you don't pay attention to all that stuff. That's why I'm your pastor. That's why I'm the pastor. Because this is a big deal. All right. Now, the second thing I want you to pay attention to is conjunctions. Conjunctions. The word like now and 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 but and for, uh, things like that. I'm looking for a conjunction. Notice the word now is the conjunction day. And notice that it's used twice in verse 4. Do you see that? The first time is translated now, and the second time is translated and, or but. But because it's used in contrast. We have different gifts, but the same Lord. It's a contrast. These contrasts are different and same. That's a, that's a typical way you do it in the Greek. Now we got the word Lord was kurios. And notice we got the conjunction an, which is chi, and we have it used again with and different gifts, uh, different ministries, and chi, the same Lord. See that? Just maybe nod your head. That would be good. <laughs> you do see that, don't you? All right. I'm just telling you the way it is in the Greek language because that's really important. Now look at God. This is such a big change. And is chi. There are variety or differences of effects or performances, but changed it. Now look up here. They don't know where you can see this, but in Greek language. Notice. When he talks about the Holy Spirit in verse 5, he used two days. Agree? D-E-D-E? -D -E? Come on. I put it on your paper. When he went to verse 5 with the Lord, he used Kai and Kai. Agreed? When he went to God, he put it, he ranked in the ranks and responsibilities. Paul put the Spirit, the great distributor, he put the Lord who sits at the right hand of God, the Savior and the body. He is both the Savior and the body, right? Savior of the body. He's the head and the Savior of the body. Ministries fall under him. Now he puts a God. When he put a God, he changed the way the conjunctions are used. To show you that God has placed himself under the plan to do something with spiritual gifts that is unique and different and out of this life idea. God has personally taken engagement and responsibility in your spiritually gifted ministry. Do you see that? That's the word day. Kai day. And look what he said. He said the same God, who works, notice it's the same word, but a verb, a participle, who works all things in all. God has personally taken responsibility of your spiritual gift performance to the plan of God. He has personally took responsibility. Please tell me you see that. 
<coughs> and Paul has made a clear distinction in conjunctions to show you that. Your spiritually gifted ministry is a big deal. I was going to title that way, but I wanted to emphasize the Godhead. Now, let me look a few things. Let me, let's look at a couple of things. Note the first change from the normal identity of the Godhead which is normally God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Notice it was changed. The order was changed, as well as responsibility. A normal order is in Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's the normal order. Whenever that order is stated differently, and it is often, you must go back and pay attention to the context because the change in order is a change of responsibility and it's a big deal. We definitely see a change in order and responsibility. He places the Holy Spirit first, the Lord second, and God third, the fact that God is even mentioned is dynamite. That God has placed himself under the plan of God to function with your spiritual gift. The performance of it. The actual performance, God is over. Think about that. I think about it every time I teach. I've got a tough guy grading me because now it's about performance. You're talking about a, a tough guy to grade you. That's the way I think about it. If you never had some tough teachers in your life and you were benefited from it later in life, weren't you? Oh, they're so tough, they make me study. <laughs> How terrible, in school and have to study. Hmm. That's, a, that's a bummer. Wait till somebody has to hire you. Ugh. Well, notice that the word son is not even used. Right? Notice that in our passage, the word son wasn't even used. We know he means that, but it was never used. The capital L was. Agreed? That's a big change. We've seen two big changes. Other than the order, we've seen that God has personally committed himself under the plan of God in the performance of your gift. And now we see that the second change has been that he didn't call him the son. He called him the Lord. Oh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful study this would be if we had the time. A Lord is a term that is used for the pre and post incarnation of Jesus Christ. The word Lord. Kurios in the Greek. Yahweh in the Hebrew. Under the Old Covenant, the term Lord Yahweh and God Elohim, like in Genesis 1.1, Elohim, notice that the I am on the end of that word makes it plural in the Hebrew. I am is plural. We're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1.1. All three involved in creation. You do know that. Boy, if you stay any time here, you know it. We teach it all the time. Notice that under the Old Covenant, the term Lord and God was used for the pre-incarnate Christ. For example, the word Lord God was used ten times with Adam and Eve in the garden in the second chapter. I, I wrote the ten out for you. You can see it easily in the English. In the second chapter of Genesis, the pre-incarnate Christ is called the Lord God. In chapter 3, 
the term Lord God is used eight times in chapter 3 with Adam and Eve again, with mankind. And once again, we're talking about the pre-incarnate Christ. It's a wonderful thing when you read it because he's described that way in and after the fall of Adam. You realize, don't you, having studied the book of Genesis with us, that he was their pastor teacher. Third chapter, verse 8. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Was it their Bible study time with the Lord God? Pre-incarnate. Now, when you come to the new covenant, we have the Lord as God. The Lord as God is used with the post-incarnation of Jesus Christ. It is used this way in 1 Corinthians 12 four, uh, through 6 and in the Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 4 through 6. All worth reading. It's used this way in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. I want to go to a moment, since I'm in Corinthians. Let me drop back to Romans, Romans the 10th chapter, verse 9. Listen to this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. Now, when you go back and look at the context, you know what you have? You have the Son of God become flesh, dwell among men, die on a cross for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead. If you read the context, now he gets down to verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus Lord, and watch, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And if you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, that he has by being raised from the dead, completing him, his mission in the plan of God and going back to the third, to the heaven, the third heaven, if you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, who is now the Lord, if you believe that, you will be saved. If you believe that, you'll be saved. He has to die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead. When he is raised from the dead, he is raised as the Lord God. When he ascends back to the Father, he takes that role and responsibility as the Lord God. And he's given authority with, with that title during the church age. Agreed? Of course. Of course. Of course. In Philippians, the second chapter, 8 through 11, this, this is discussed. I want to read the, the, the very tag at the end. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when he's used as Lord, he's used in the context that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven over authority, and one of these great authorities, authority over the universe and yet his great interest is Lord over the church ministry. Think about that. He sets in authority over all of the universe. And his great passion is being Lord over the church ministries. You think your ministry is not a big deal. It is in heaven. You got to stop being so careless with this idea. Well, I don't know what my gift is. How is it possible you don't know what your gift is? It's as simple to understand as your salvation. Do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? You got to believe the Bible to know you're saved, right? You don't know you're saved because... You got goofy feelings going on in you. The Bible tells you you are. If you believe that he died for your sins, is buried and raised from the dead, if you believe that, you're saved. The Bible says, and that's where your assurance is, that's true with your gift. You, are, you have been gifted at the point of salvation. The Holy Spirit distributed personally. Distribute it individually and personally. That's verse 11. As he wills. 
That's his responsibility is to put the right people in the right churches with their gifts. I don't have to go. I never go out and search for gifted people. It's not my job. My job is pray. The manifest of Father, manifest them. I need to have them manifested. How do I know? I just got one gift. I'm just one of the gifted of many of my body of Christ that I'm part of. I'm just one of many. I'm just the teacher aspect guy, pastoring. Well, we learn from both the pre- and post-incarnation of Jesus Christ that the Son of the Godhead is the visible manifestation of the Godhead. He was the pastor teacher of Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis 3, 8. For example, when you want to see the pre-incarnation, you look at passages like Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Or you discuss, you discuss it with Eve in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 5. Write these two passages next to that. Write these two down. Revelation 12, 9 and 22. 20 verse 2. Because you, you may not know who the serpent was that deceived Eve. And he's identified in Revelation 12, 9, without exception, you can know, and Revelation 20, verse 2. So the, you need those. The post-carnation, in the post-incarnation of Jesus Christ, we have Colossians 1, 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. For Colossians 1, 15. Or you might write this one down. You know it. But how about John 1.14? The Word became flesh and dwelt among men. When that happened in the birth story of Jesus Christ, when that happened, he, they called him Emmanuel. <laughs> God with us, living among us, walking and breathing, setting and eating among us. Emmanuel among us. You remember that, don't you? In Colossians 2.9, in him, Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Don't you know he was something to behold? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. described that all of the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form in the person of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 1.3, he's described, Jesus is described as the exact representation of divine nature. The exact representation of divine nature. Now, you ready for this? Huh? <laughs> you ready for this one? Oh, get ready now. This is a bonus. This is a bonus. Won't cost you anything. Here's a bonus. Second Peter 1 4. Write that down because that's you. You see, he exchanged his divine nature for human nature to give you his divine nature. Second Peter 1 4. When you got saved, you have a divine nature. Ah, <laughs> how about that? You know what we call that in, in, in baby terms? You have been born again by the Spirit of God. You've been born again. You're not born again as a human. You're born again as a spiritual person, not as a carnal person, not as a flesh person, but as a divine person. You've been born again. As a divine person, you were born again to be a divine person. You were, you, were you were born again designed to live holiness among your, to live out Emmanuel among your friends and family and neighbors. Emmanuel, the God among us. <laughs> Woo. How about that? Whoa. Uh, you still with me? Uh, okay. Point number two. 
Before we take a break, I want to show you one more change that's really important. Conjunction. Conjunctions. I mean, who even pays attention to conjunctions? Uh, guys who study language. Right, Ernie? Boy, we do. And boy, are they important, especially when Paul writes. The second change is with conjunctions. I mentioned that in my introduction. The big change is in verse 6, when he went from Kai to day. In verse 4, he kept them day, day. In verse 5, he went Kai, Kai. <laughs> Sounds like baby talk, doesn't it? But in verse 6, when he comes to God, he goes from Kai to day. Now, the writers in the, at least the New American Standard, and in some ways, really understood this, and they understood some marvelous principles. For example, in verse 4, when he used day and they translated it now, you looking at your Bible? Does it say now? No American does. In the Greek, that's the word day, and the reason they translated it, listen, they were on top of their game, the reason they translated that now was to connect that now, they put day, to connect it with chapter 12, verse 1. And they call that word now to show you that in the new subject that's being opened up on spiritual gift, there is one that you need to pay special attention to. He used, they word, the word now means that there is a subject within the subject of importance in, verse, in, the, in this passage, 4, 5, and 6. The Godhead is involved. Pay attention to the order and responsibility. I mean, how did I learn that? How did I, get, well, how did I do that? I saw that, and I went, whoa. Because that's what you do when you study the languages. The subject, the subject, something about spiritual gifts, there's something in that that's really important for you to know about, and that's the Godhead, the order and responsibility. And he used the conjunction to show us that. He used the conjunctions. You say, well, what's, what, what is the point? <laughs> well, I, I told you what is the big point, but let me show you another doctrinal point. Let me show you another doctrinal point. Let me show you, just with the use of conjunction. Once God the Son returns to, the he to heaven, third heaven, in session, like in Fe Ephesians 1, 19 through 22, seated at the right hand of God the Father. God the Father took an active role along with the Holy Spirit with spiritual gifts of the church. Think about that. When the Son returned and sat down with all authority given to Him, and when His term is over on the seat, He will hand that all back to God, right? We know this. We've studied this. This is elementary. But when He switched that over and the Father coronated him to the throne. The father took an active role in the dynamics of the church in regard to spiritual gifts in the performance of the ministry of the gift. Listen. Listen. That's why I teach the way I teach and why you come to learn. You got to ask yourself, is this a big deal? Is this a big deal? Paul thought it was. Paul thought this was really important for you to know, and he laid it out as simply as it could be laid out. My job is just to bring it there. Now, let me show you something. He's going to go on. In chapter 12, he's going to go on. 
and he's going to discuss the, God's role in the performance of spiritual gifts. Are you with me? Just stay with me just a little longer. We'll get a cup of coffee and be happy. Are you with me? Yes. I, Pam's always, when I, I press a couple of times, I won't get Pam to give me an answer. You, the rest of you, I, I left you on, I said coffee break, and you already went on it. Let me just show you. See, he sets us up so that when he tells us later some things about God's active role in spiritual gifts, you'll know this. Watch what he says. In the 12th chapter, verse 18, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body as he desires, in other words, according to the master plan. Look at, look at uh, the 12th chapter, 24 and 25. But God has so composed the body, given more abundant honor to the member which lacks, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care one for another. See, that's God's desire. Look at verse 28 through 31. And God has appointed in the church, and then he gives a list of gifts. Then in, verse, in chapter 14, verse 33, it says, For God, still talking about spiritual gifts, for God is not that God of confusion, but of peace in all the churches of the saints. We just studied uh, the calling of saints on Wednesday. For those who attended that, that'll have great meaning to your life. Number three, Christian theology of the Godhead is unique to all the religions of the world. They always want to compare us because we believe we're monotheistic in their terms, they uh, always want to lump us. Well, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, uh, they're pretty much all the same. They believe in the one God. Uh, you can talk to all of them. They believe that Jesus came, was a unique person, uh, a great prophet, teacher, yada, 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 yada. They don't understand how different Christianity's theology of God is. Godhead is unique to the Christian. Godhead, or some call it Trinity, Latin word for it. Don't understand how unique it really is to us. We believe the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. We believe they had a name, a divine name attached to that birth called Emmanuel. And we believe that he was one of three members of the Godhead. We believe that. We teach it. It is in our Bible. The Bible opens in the beginning, and he uses in the beginning God, and he used the word Elohim. I am in the Hebrew is always plural. Some of the world say, well, it means one of many gods. That's not what Elohim means. Elohim means is the plurality of God. We, we believe in monotheistic about one God and three persons. And in those three persons are three different functions or different functions in the plan of God. We believe that it's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. We believe that was determined in eternity past, and we believe that the angelic conflict in human history was over the eternal life conference where, G, where the second member of the Godhead was going to be declared the centerpiece of the plan of God that erupted a revolution in eternity past led by Satan, Lucifer. We believe that stuff. <laughs> we believe everybody else has come up with their own idea on it. We believe very definitely the Godhead consists of three united persons without separate existence, so completely united as to form one God, Elohim. It certainly all the writers of the New Testament believe it, believed it because they all wrote about it. They all wrote about it. When you see Genesis 1.1 or Romans 1.25, it, it is obvious to us what you're talking about. 
And when you look at creation, you're going to see that all three members of the Godhead were involved in creation. All three members were involved in creation. We've studied that. And God the Father was involved in it. God the Son was involved in it. And God the Holy Spirit was involved in creation, all three of them. Anytime all three members show up and are involved in any, uh, any biblical history event, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Each member of the Godhead possesses the same divine essence. You know, we put an essence box on the board, and we put three boxes underneath it. We say the boxes underneath it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in that box, that main box, we call that the essence of God. And we talk about sovereignty and eternal life and righteousness and love. All these things about God, immutable, veracity, omnipresent, you know that box. One of essence, and different in persons, and different functions. All according to the plan of God. And when we come to spiritual gifts, that concept is clearly seen. That the roles, the Godhead, the, the unique roles they have, yet they're of one. Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, you've, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to be another, another Paracletus, he used the word alas, meaning another like me. It's pretty clear in the Bible, uh, what John 10, 30. I love that passage. That's one of great interest. John 14, 9 through 11, verse 16. The Godhead, the members of the Godhead are co-equal and eternal, like John 1, 18. John 17, 5, and 24. These are passages I don't go into great discussion because I know this congregation knows that. We teach it from the little kids all the way to the adult parents. We have taught this for 45 years here. The structure of the essence of God, God the Father. and We've been very strong in our teaching of this. It's certainly something that we all believe. You see, the distinction, the distinction is in their function, their person and their function. The God's, God, and we see it in the spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit distributes. The Lord is the Lord over the ministries, and God is over the performance. We see it clearly, do we not? Of course. And this is the way they always work. What you do is you pay attention. Whenever you find a passage and they're listed, pay attention to the order they're listed, and then you got to go back and study context. The Bible is not book for lazy people. If there's a book in your life that requires you to be on your toes when you read it, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. The distinction of the persons of the Godhead are in the function of the plan of God. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6 with spiritual gifts. Therefore, all members of the Godhead, listen, this is so important. Circle the word subordinate. You ought to learn that. Even the Godhead understands they surrender their will to the plan of God. God the Father did when he said, I will be in charge of the performance. God the Son, I'll be in charge of the ministries. They all had to submit, not my will, but thy will be done. And they have to operate according to the will of God. That laid out in the word of God. You can't change it. You're a subordinate. Your gift function and your life in Christ functions under not my will, but his will be done. Your life would go a lot smoother if you'd learned that. Because when you buck, buck up against the will of God, you're going to lose that argument every time. <laughs> you're going to lose. You're never going to win that argument. They don't even argue it. That word subordinate to the will of God in the plan of God is clearly seen with Jesus in Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 39, and 42. He says it very clearly. Not my will, thy will be done. 
And he laid out his will. And the father went, no. Father went, no. You know. You know how this thing plays out. Now listen to me. Now we know that, don't we? We've studied that. He says to him, no, you know how this is, plays out, son. It is the end that makes, this thing, that makes the journey wonderful. It's the end that makes the journey wonderful. See, we don't understand that. You want to give up in the middle of a journey. You want, it's too tough. It's too this. It's too that. I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. The end of the journey that he has you on is where the great rewards are for your life. And when you look back, you will say, I would never want to go through it again, but I wouldn't take anything for having gone through it for what I know about my relationship with God and how faithful he is to me. Have we not all seen that? Have we not seen that? I mean, the first day you walked in the office and they said they gave you this terrible news. Now it's your job to make it good news. It's your, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to coach yourself up to the level God wants you to be. And you battled my will versus his. You battled it for a while. The best thing to do is surrender. The quicker you surrender, the better off it comes. The better the journey, the sweeter the opportunities, the, the more fun you can have with adversity. None of us, none of us, none of us are going to get out of here without it. None of us. We're in too deep. We're in too deep. You have no idea the things that he's going to present to you that other people are going to cry over. They're going to hold your hand and cry with you. And it's going to be one of the greatest journeys of your life because God is faithful. God is faithful. He's enormously faithful. What God has surrendered to the Son on your behalf, what he has surrendered to his son who died on that cross, the Lord says, I don't know if I want to go to this. this, this. And he said, son, the joy is in the journey. The joy is in the end. You have no idea until you study the Bible with some seriousness how much the father surrendered to the son and stepped under his authority in the church age. So you've, you've missed that. You've missed that when he was sitting on the throne in his sovereignty, surrendered that to the son when he gave him the son, the authority over all authority. When he gave authority over all authority to his son, he put himself under it. He did it again with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, I distribute the gift. As, as I wish. And the Father salutes him. Now think about that. And the Father salutes him. You're right. <laughs> think about that. And you don't know what your gift is. Listen to me. Because you don't want to know. It's not a secret and it's not hidden. It's a foundational principle of doctrine. And you need to know it and let the three members of the Godhead work your gift to its maximum opportunity. It'll make this church better and it'll make other churches better as you minister gift to them as well. Are you aware of what your gift is? When your gift goes out and serves another church, that gift serves, listen to me, not only does it serve the body, listen to me now, this is so important, not only does it serve the body, it serves those with the gift. 
in the most unique way. That they see the maturity of your soul through the study of the word of God. And they go like, well, I have that gift, but I don't see that. What is the difference? And over a week with them, they will see the difference is your capacity of spiritual growth maturity. And they'll go like, I want that. I got the gift, but I don't have the capacity. When your gift goes out to another church, it's going to serve them not only to the body, but it's going to serve those who have the gift to the body. For them to realize they don't have the maturity. They have the gift and don't have the maturity. I want you to keep an eye open for that. You watch that. And you'll pay attention to the people who write you and respond to you. Who call you up or, 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 or before you leave, their, their body give you some special hugs and some special stuff. When I go speak to other groups, I can see my gift function to a growth responsibility. And then all of a sudden, men who have the gift of teacher, those people circle, circle me like Indians after, I don't know, they circle me. I mean, they, just, they, can't, they, they have to talk to me. They have to write to me. They have to contact me. They have to be a, some way. And, 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 I, and I know that now. And so I just, I just minister to them. And gift to gift. Just gift to gift about growth, about the need for growth in the Word of God, that need for growth. It's a phenomenal thing. I hope you're experiencing it out of your own gift. Jesus Christ is the only visible member of the Godhead. Jeez, think about that. He's the only visible member of the Godhead. And, and listen, he's the Lord of our life. And you know why? One day he's coming. In his visible representation of the Godhead, he's coming. He's coming. And if you was to say to him, show me your nail-scarred hands. Show me where the spear went in. You suppose he could show you? Well, if you read John, if you read John 20, you know. Hopefully we wouldn't want to ask those questions. We would rather wipe his feet with our hairs, wouldn't we? All of that's capacity of growth, isn't it? All of that is capacity of growth. I give you a lot of scriptures on Jesus, the only visible member of the Godhead. And my final point is homework. You didn't think he was going to come without homework, did you? I'm going to give you homework. Homework. You should love this homework. What I did, I wanted to show you whenever all members of the Godhead are involved in an event of biblical history, it's a big deal. And so I gave you Matthew 28, 19. I gave you 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, which we studied. I gave you 2 Corinthians 13, 14, John 14, 16, 7, and 26, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, and 1 Peter 1, 2, where all, all these passages have God had mentioned. You know what would be of importance to you? See how they're listed. There's a normal order. And when the normal order is not given, pay attention. Pay attention. You're going to have to look at context, but pay attention because there's a whole lesson in that itself. A whole lesson. And then the virgin conception of Jesus Christ. Luke 1, 32 and 35. The Father's role. The Holy Spirit's role in Luke 135 and the son's role in Galatians 4 and 5, Galatians 4 verses 4 and 5, and Matthew 1, 20 through 23. It's a good little, a little good little homework for you. You'll enjoy studying that. You'll enjoy seeing the Godhead listed. And these are only a few. I just wanted to show you the Godhead's a big deal. 
And your spiritual gift's a big deal because all three of them are engaged in it in some way or another. That's a big deal. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you all the things that we have learned today under the ministry of the Holy Spirit out of the Word of God, both out of the superb English language and the Greek. I want to thank you, Father, for the years of study of both of these languages. I want to tell you personally what an honor it is for this kid from Podunk, Michigan to have the vast knowledge that I have. And I know it's because of your grace and because you are faithful. It's not, it's not by hook or crook or anything I've done. Just the passion I have passion I have to know your will and you've sent us people over the years father who have a passion for it some have gone on to teach others this passion some have given up on that passion but here we are faithful to the end I pray this upon our people stop putting off finding out what their gift is it's not a secret. It's not hidden. And then watch the three members of the Godhead work phenomenally with your gift and see how it works in the lives of people. It's a phenomenal, Father. Nothing like it ever in the Word of God. Nothing like what we have in the church right here at Doctrinal Studies. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I pray this upon your blessed name in Jesus' name. Amen.